Welcome to the Nomi Key Show. I am Nomi Key Konst. If you are not subscribing already, please hit subscribe. We are just over a month old and we hit 25,000 subscriptions. And I want to thank you guys for all of your support, uh, for being patrons, for, for subscribing on YouTube, because it's listeners and viewers like you who've been able to uh, build this show. We've been able to go out there and, and do longer interviews and to do more live streams. Honestly, we wouldn't be able to do it if you guys weren't watching the show. So so thank you. Uh, keep subscribing. Keep sharing. And we have a great show today. We have the former foreign minister of Greece, George Katrugalos. He's going to talk about uh, the left movement in Greece, how Syriza, the leftist party, was able to win and why it is that they lost in this last election cycle, what we can learn from Greece, and if they have a movement moving forward that's going to grow. Um, it's a fascinating interview. There's so much to learn from from left movements abroad electorally. And I think uh, going into this election cycle, you know, we need to learn from from our allies uh, who have fought the neoliberal establishment as much as we have. It's a great show. Uh, looking forward to speaking with him. Believe it or not, uh, we don't have the only left movement <laughs> in this world, but I know you guys know that. Uh, one of the great successes in the last uh, few years was the success of the left movement out of Greece. Uh, the Syriza party, that the coalition that came together, uh, won over the government, and this was during austerity, fighting back against uh, Germany and the EU. And, um, you know, unfortunately, in the last election, uh, they, they lost power, but there's more to the story here. Uh, of course, every country in the EU has their own story, and the UK has their own story, and we have our own story. I'm just so grateful that our next guest was there uh, at the table, has been on the ground, and of course leading the charge for the last few years. Uh, we are so honored to have the former foreign minister of Greece, George Katrugalas, join the show. Thank you so much, George, for, for joining and uh, telling us a little bit about what happened in Greece recently. Well, in Greece, as in the rest of Europe, we are struggling to fight this neoliberal orthodoxy, which dominates the last decades. And as you understand, it's not good for uh, uh, the majority of the population, at least for the 99%. We have been an exception. We have won two consecutive elections in 2015, exactly uh, by promoting uh, a broader, uh, let's say, uh, fight against austerity, and especially in Greece, against the manipulation that our debtors wanted to impose for the country. Unfortunately, in July 2015, we had to reach a compromise with our debtors, exactly because the alternative would be the full destruction of our economy. There have been people of the extreme, let's say, neoliberal circles in our continent that would like to make Greece an example so what's happening when a country is not following the orthodoxy, the only way, the only neoliberal way, and they wanted to victimize uh, Greece exactly in order to show that there's no other alternative. Under this uh, spectrum of uh, full destruction of our economy, we were working for a week with uh, the banks closed. We reached this uh, compromise. Uh, we had to compromise on... Uh, a new memorandum, a new agreement with our debtors, which was again a neoliberal program, although much milder of the previous followed at this time. Exactly because that there was a compromise, we had to reach again to the Greek people and to ask them if we were accepting the compromise after having explained the reasons. Of course, more analytically that I had the time to do it now with you. And uh, again, the Greek people has renewed it's uh, uh, trust uh, mm -hmm. towards us. And has given us the chance to uh, uh, govern for about four and a half years. Mm -hmm. There have been mixed results in uh, these uh, four and a half years. First of all, we had the fear resistance of the Greek establishment. Uh, you have a, a feeling of what is now by following the campaign of Bernie. Right. In addition to that, we had these strict limitations deriving from the memorandum, this compromise I was describing before. So we are practically governing by having strict obligations that we have accepted, but also trying to promote a parallel program 
conforming to the ideas of the left, of equality, mm -hmm. of social equity, and justice. And we had results. We have uh, uh, very highly uh, optimum results in reducing poverty, mm -hmm. in reducing major inequality. But still, at the end of these four and a half years, we have not been in the position to fully reverse the accumulated uh, misery of uh, almost uh, 10 years of continuous austerity imposed to us by this memoranda program, by this, uh, uh, let's say, neoliberal orthodoxy uh, operating also in a kind of uh, vacuum of democracy. So the Greek citizens did not, uh, have not taken their face away from us. They still have given us 32 percent mm -hmm. of, uh, of the votes, which is the highest percentage that a party of uh, the left uh, has uh, uh, gained in Europe. But <clears throat> they have given an even bigger percentage to the Conservatives, right. hoping that they could reverse the situation, and exactly because uh, the Conservatives have followed a very demagogic pre-electoral campaign, emphasizing not just uh, on issues of, uh, uh, like the ones I have mentioned, economic and societal issues, but also they have made a very nationalistic campaign by trying to uh, demonstrate uh, an historical agreement that the government citizen, the Syriza government has reached with our northern neighbors, northern Macedonia, mm -hmm. which, which has ended a dispute of about uh, three decades. So let's this, let's talk about that for a second, because, um, yeah, you know, okay. I don't think most people uh, are aware of, of this huge deal. I mean, this was... Um, it took courage. You were literally at the table uh, negotiating this deal. And, and it's something that, um, you know, it was, it was a big success for, for your administration, for the Tsipras administration, but also became a weapon uh, by the, 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 the right wing, which was, is led by an oligarch. So I think the first question is, can you explain what happened in Macedonia? And then I, I want to talk a little bit about who you were facing, um, who the party, the cities a party was facing as the opposition in Greece and, and sort of the legacy it has, the long legacy uh, in Greek politics. So let's start with Macedonia. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. There is a dispute, there, ha there has been a dispute with our northern neighbors dating back to the 90s. It was uh, basically about the name of the, that uh, there is a new democracy right. <laughs> that uh, has been part of uh, the, uh, the former Yugoslavia, Tito's Yugoslavia mm -hmm. would like to, to have. Of course, the name was just uh, the only cause. There have been, uh, in the past, uh, irredentist uh, aspirations on some parts of the, of the nationalistic parties in this uh, country. There have been uh, uh, maps uh, describing uh, their uh, territorial uh, reventications of a greater Macedonia, mm -hmm. including also parts of Greece. As it happens in all these cases, nationalist circles in uh, one country, they were feeding the narrative and also the hatred of nationalists at the other side of the frontiers. Right. So, when, uh, it was not, uh, when it has not been made possible for an agreement in the 90s, then we had uh, 30 years of a very bitter dispute mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on an issue that it could be very easily resolved mm -hmm. with a very, uh, let's say, fair compromise that we have uh, uh, managed to, 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 to achieve with uh, uh, the, uh, the very courageous uh, uh, policy of Prime Minister Zaev in North Macedonia and Alexis Tsipras in Greece. It was so logical, so rational, and it said such an optimistic message to the other countries of the area, of the Balkans, a very, uh, as you understand, tormented area, mm -hmm. that everybody loved it, this agreement. Uh, and especially, of course, the people of the left, progressive people, who, who knows that uh, patriotism does not mean that you must hate your neighbor. Right. But uh, it has been used, as you correctly said, uh, Nomi, uh, as a weapon by the conservatives, who are trying in all countries uh, where there is a, a strong uh, progressive movement to discredit it. So they uh, presented that uh, agreement as a kind of treason, although uh, it was not far away from what uh, the, the same party of New Democracy, of our conservatives, was negotiating in the past. However, 
in addition to this feeling of, let's say, wounded uh, patriotism, uh, of wounded uh, dignity that our uh, electorate had because of the years of, uh, uh, of the austerity and the memoranda, this worked. And mm -hmm. uh, we lost a number of votes that they would uh, renew their confidence in us if there was not uh, this agreement. So Syriza, um, you know, it was interesting because you built this coalition that, that hadn't existed before. The left, uh, I was there for election day and it, if, of the EU election day and, and, and later. And it's, it's so fascinating because there's every single form of the Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> you have many factions on the left. Uh, if we think it's bad here, you know, <laughs> wait till you go to Greece where everybody has an opinion. <laughs> and it's very hard to get everybody on the same page. Yet you were able to do it uh, to win the election, as you said, in 2015. Um, but some of that, there, there were some factions that broke apart. And and of course, that uh, was was how New Democracy, Mitsotakis, who is an oligarch, let's just reiterate that, uh, was able to take... Uh, to take to win the election. So, can you um, describe sort of the political dynamics of Syriza versus New Democracy? Mm -hmm. First of all, there is a, a, let's say a division that it is not a topic to Greece. It is a universal. This uh, division between progressive forces and forces of uh, neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, we have a lot of uh, specificities related to the political system of Greece. Just imagine, uh, Nomi, that uh, in the last 60 years, with two exceptions, we had prime ministers just out of three political families. Right. This, this is worse than in oh, Pakistan. No, we, we know that, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've, we've had a few of those here. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. And that's, this does not reflect only a distortion of the political system. It, uh, we have in Greece what we call the entanglement, mm -hmm. the aploki, that is political and economic interests are working at uh, the top of the state, distorting both the normal functioning of the market by giving special favors, uh, the, 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 the government, to their uh, favorite businessmen. And inversely, these businessmen helping the political uh, parties of the establishment in order to, to ensure this uh, symbiotic uh, relationship. Okay. We have been a party of 4%. And exactly because of that, we have been completely out of this scheme of, uh, of entanglement. That was one of, the, one of the reasons that the Greek people has, uh, have uh, trusted us. Because as you said, Syriza was not and still is not a homogeneous, uh, let's say, monolithic political party. In my mind, it's very close to this coalition that brought Allende in Chile mm -hmm. in power in uh, 73. So... Uh, our great force is exactly that uh, under a very charismatic leader, Alexis Tsipras, we managed to bring together all democratic and progressive elements of our uh, society that have been uh, simultaneously against uh, neoliberalism and against the continuation of this old political uh, regime. For this reason, we are now uh, reconfirmed our position as the second pole in, uh, of this new reorganized political uh, system. Mm -hmm. One pole of the conservatives, the other is us. It's exactly because I know that there is some discussion sometimes taking very pessimistic uh, connotations in, in the States right. regarding the failure of uh, uh, Corbyn, regarding the recent failure of us. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the broader picture, the, what one sees in Europe is exactly that uh, the old uh, political establishment cannot continue to rule as before. So not just in countries like Greece, where we had a full reversal in favor of the left, even in countries like France, the old establishment has collapsed. Right. They have there the chance, of course, to promote a candidate who is not uh, putting into question the dynamics of uh, neoliberalism. But he is completely new. Macron is not part of the old uh, establishment. If you see in uh, the European South, Spain and Portugal, there the situation is much better because uh, this uh, reversal of the old, uh, uh, let's say, balance of uh, forces has brought into power coalitions of the left, including the Social Democrats. So I think there's a general dissatisfaction of uh, the everyday citizen with uh, the continuation of, let's say, the ancien regime 
And this is reflected in Greece as in other places in Europe. Um, before we, we wrap up, I looking forward, I know it, it's hard to say right now, it's still very soon, but um, you know, one thing that I, I, I don't think people realize outside of uh, maybe Greece <laughs> is how many young people have been forced to leave Greece um, to, to continue their educations elsewhere so that they mm -hmm. have opportunities. Um, maybe they go back home, but uh, for the most part, there's there's been an exodus of, of millennials and beyond because it's just so hard to survive in Greece. And um, we, I believe is in Greece, they have the most educated population in all of Europe, if I'm correct. You are very right. And this is one of the big advantages we have for the restarting our economy, mm -hmm. for the reboot that we need. But many of these people must come back. Right. Because it's, it's another thing to go abroad for studies. I have done that myself, but then I have returned. Right. And it is completely another thing to, be, to feel be, being forced to leave your country because you do not have viable alternatives at home. So moving forward in terms of the election, um, and, and this was a, you know, the first election you, people were able to, uh, this, can, this can hurt too, the diaspora is very conservative, but um, uh, they were able to vote in this election. But moving forward, uh, so much of, of the younger generation is more in line with, with Tsipra and Syriza and the left. So do yes. you see the party regaining gaining strength in the coming years um, and, and really coming back to the core principles? This is our big bet. Uh, as you said, uh, at uh, the age cohort from 17 to 35, these consecutive dynamic uh, generations, Syriza has taken 38% of, uh, of the electorate and has been uh, uh, leading new democracy, the conservatives. Okay. Problem is that as a party, we do not have yet uh, uh, reorganized ourselves so as, uh, as a structured party to reflect this trust. This is our big bet towards our Congress. And I hope that we are going to manage to realign our, let's say, organizational uh, capacity with this trust of the people. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're looking to you. And hopefully our elections will and be able to influence. We are looking to you, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. See, it is solidarity. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Minister, thank no, you so I much. I must say that uh, Bernie's mm -hmm. campaign has been a great source of inspiration and also of pride yeah. for all democratic and progressive uh, people, not just in Greece, throughout Europe, yeah. throughout the world, I would say. I mean, we, we were... We're very proud to be part of this movement. We have our own fights. Uh, they're, they're not as big. Um, they're party fights, but, you know, hopefully we'll be able you to get through them. You are reshaping the American society, not just the Democratic Party. Yeah. And this is going to have uh, much, much uh, long-term, uh, uh, let's say, uh, repercussions than... Uh, we hope, of course, everybody, all of us, that yeah. Ben is going to win. But it is not just for next elections. It's something, I think, much deeper and much more in a long-term perspective than that. I hope so. This this neoliberal uh, globalization is it needs it needs to be stopped because it's hurting too many people, too many working people. So hopefully we'll be holding hands in solidarity very soon when we're all in office, uh, meaning all of our <laughs> countries have, have gained the left power. Um, Minister, thank you very much for joining us. I know it's late at night in Greece. No, uh, it was a pleasure. <laughs> actually, it's dinner time in Greece. What am I kidding? <laughs> I know. <laughs> go, go have some uzo. Es que esto para puli. Para calonam. You are listening or watching The Nomi Key Show. If you're not already, please subscribe to us on YouTube. We just hit 25,000 and we are growing. Uh, and of course, please be a patron on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show. Our patrons are what they're our lifeblood. It's what, how we're able to to do so many segments, to edit, to have great guests on, to do the research. This is a real operation, and it wouldn't be happening if you guys weren't investing in us. Uh, thank you so much for your subscriptions so far, and let's keep this going. Our next guest does not really need an introduction. He is. He's a great in my mind. Uh, he wrote the very famous book, taught my mom all about politics actually, uh, when he wrote What's the Matter with Kansas? And I think the generation of 2016 learned everything about the Democratic Party from his book, Listen Liberal. And he has a recent book out called Rendezvous with Oblivion. It's a series of essays. Of course, I'm talking about the one, the only Thomas Frank. Thank you so much for joining the Nomi Key Show. <laughs> 
Oh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. So last time I talked to you uh, on a set, interviewed you, we were, I think it was the year after, 2017, in Washington. And uh, at that point, you know, Listen Liberal had recently come out and uh, we'd had this horrific election in 2016 in which the Democrats should have learned all of their lessons. Uh, if, If they didn't from the experience, they should have read your book and learned from your documentation of what went wrong and how to fix it. But here we are in 2020, moving into the Iowa caucuses, and it seems like the establishment is playing the same tricks. What, what, what's your take? Has- well, it's the same two wings of the party uh, going at it again. It's it's not quite as ferocious as 2016. There was this real uh, sense in 2016 that um, – challenging the sort of uh, leadership faction of the party, the centrist faction of the party, that challenging them was was an illegitimate thing to do. That, that was not – that was in some way um, not acceptable or, you know, not playing by the rules or something like that, which I, uh, you know, honestly – I mean, I get it culturally. I get that that's what they thought, but it's it's kind of a silly thing. I mean, the whole idea of, of democracy is there's more than one candidate, you know. And, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton was not – the incumbent, uh, et cetera. And so it was an open uh, primary. And this time it's even, of course, it's even more wide open. I mean, how many candidates were there in the beginning? But it is boiling down to the uh, the, the, the centrist faction uh, against the liberal faction, and we're going to see what happens. And uh, you're seeing a lot of the same uh, rhetoric get wheeled out. I think, um, I mean, Obviously, the biggest difference is it looks like Bernie Sanders has a has a real chance to win this time, which is uh, really remarkable. <laughs> As of today, I mean, he is leading in the polls. He has the That's widest right. exactly. margin. Exactly. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw that last night. It's really remarkable. It's incredible. And, and in terms of, up, you know, head to head with Trump, he has the widest margin uh, in defeating Trump, which. You know, right. But that's something that's very difficult for people to understand. There, especially people here in Washington D.C., there is this way, this this way in which we've internalized this kind of geometry of politics, where uh, uh, people think that the closer you are to the center, you know, understood in a kind of geometric sense, like here's the left, here's the right, there's the center, it's in between them both. Therefore, the person in the center is, uh, you know, automatically going to be. Uh, the most effective challenger. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, there's a political science name for it. Oh, no, I, I had it on the tip of my tongue a second ago, and now I forgot Quick, what, Google it. <laughs> you know, what, this, what this theory is called. But it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it doesn't even really need to have a name. It's, it's something that everyone in Washington knows is true. You don't even need to think about it. It's just obvious to them. And so it's a complete surprise uh, it, it's it's counterintuitive. It's not really thinkable when you say that someone like Bernie, who is obviously off to the left of the party, uh, that that someone like Bernie actually has a you know is a stronger candidate against Trump than someone in the center like Buttigieg or even Joe Biden. Um, but nevertheless, that is the case. Do, you know, you've you've documented this quite a bit, but does that have much to do with the the institutions that are supporting the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party itself and the people who make up uh, the ecosystem of Beltway politics being supported <laughs> by, you know, essentially big oh, business. Yes. Oh, and- yes. No. It's, I wouldn't say big business. Oh, by the way, I thought of it's called the it's called the median voter uh, theory and mm-hmm. the median voter theory. The idea is that the voter in the in the middle is the one who gets you know what they want, so you have to you have to move to the middle, and that's the only way that you win an election. Um, and that has been sort of uh, refuted and countered in all sorts of different ways. But it's like I say, it's common sense uh, here in Washington D.C. Now the thing about it is that the people who call themselves centrists, who say that they're in the middle of the spectrum, really aren't. Right. I don't know if you're aware. <laughs> if you're aware, of this. well, a perfect example that we're talking about right now, uh, Joe Biden's. Um, uh, his his openness to cuts to Social Security over the decades, right. and this is you know extremely well documented. He's part of that faction. That I mean, this is in Listen Liberal, which I wrote um, five years ago now, uh, not 
uh, as it pertains to Biden, but as it pertains to Bill Clinton and the Clinton administration. And they uh, came up with all sorts of plans for privatizing Social Security, and they probably would have got it done had it not been for the la- for, for Bill Clinton's impeachment. Well, here's the thing that's going to blow your mind, Nomi. That may be uh, the position of the faction in the party that calls itself centrist, mm-hmm. but that is not like in the center of American opinion at all. That is the, you know, that is the, the sort of the, the a, a consensus opinion of a certain kind of American, a certain very well-to-do white collar, you know, an American that's had some exposure to economic, uh, you know, uh, academic economics, that sort of thing. And they tend to believe that they also tend to believe very predictable things about uh, say trade, uh, uh, issues you know mm-hmm. there's a whole a whole series of, of questions where they believe very strongly things that the American public does not believe that are not even close to the center but we call them the centrist faction because they're in <laughs> The Republicans know, are so far right <laughs> I don't know yes, yes and they're in the center of 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 politics as it's played in Washington DC. So it's so interesting. It, by the kind of ecosystem of this city, the right. sort of, uh, uh, you know, the cultural ecosystem of this city, they're kind of in the middle. It, it's interesting because, I, you know, when Donald Trump ran, obviously he was a threat to the Republican establishment. And, and they did some sort of quasi deal to get, you know, the tax breaks for the Republican Party and their supporters. And of course, now they're they're locked up for uh, the reelection. But with that being said, he... I think he confused the Democratic Party as well. I mean, they're they're investing in Joe Biden and thinking that Joe Biden acting like he supports the working class versus having the values, uh, the anti-establishment values and also uh, the values that represent working people. I mean, it, it, to me, it just seems like such an obvious misstep that will yeah. lead us into 2000 again being in 2016. But with that being said, you know, you bring up a really interesting point about the spectrum. You, we see these like graphics on the internet where well, this is the spectrum in the UK, this is the spectrum in South America, and this is what the left is in America. And of course, we're way further to the right. I have always felt, and I don't know if this is just like my wild theory, that this is all based on like a series of polling questions and which exactly. And if they let you write the polling questions, right. no, me, you'd, <laughs> you'd have a completely different results. Or if they let you like dictate the programming on CNN or something right. like that, it's like you know, if you have the if you have those kind of tools, or if or say for example, uh, you know, uh, President Obama had been uh, really uh, innovative and really forceful and really bold and had put all kinds of things on the policy agenda that weren't there previously. Well, we'd be arguing about those things today exactly. or say Occupy Wall Street was still around. You know, there's a million things that could be different and, and uh, all of people's attitudes would be completely changed. It's mm-hmm. it, those kinds of, uh, of statistics and charts that you're describing are just ways of, you know, of, of turning your brain off. By the way, to, to get back to Biden, I totally agree with you that he is he's. Uh, a huge disappointment on the issues. But, you know, I was, I may be the only guy in America, America who did this. I read his entire interview with the New York Times uh, editorial board. I read the whole thing. It took like two hours, but I read it word for word. And it's funny because he's, uh, and I don't want to compare him to Trump. That would be cruel. But he, um, Verbally, he and Trump are really similar. They, they, uh, you know, Trump sort of free associates and gets things really wildly wrong. And Biden also will be wandering along, and then his brain will like slip a gear or something, and he'll be talking about something completely different with no indication, right? And it's just a mess. Yeah. And you're reading this, and he's alternately really disappointing. He's denying all sorts of things that he obviously did. He's claiming credit for things that he had nothing to do with. You know, like if anything good happened in, in the Obama years, it's his his doing. You know. Right. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on. And it's incoherent. But then you get to the, I think it's the last question, and they ask him about, about blue collar voters, specifically white working class voters. And Biden had a really good answer that he delivered in complete sentences. You know, clearly all of a sudden his brain turned on and he was able to, and he said, look, you you know, we all think that these people are so reactionary, but if you frame things in the right way, mm. they can be, they can be more progressive than you and me, you know, a lot more. And he, he put it very well, I thought. And so the, the man has this, there is this level on which he still connects with those voters. And again, those are going to be the swing voters 
one more time in 2020. And, uh, you know, uh, one, by the way, one of the the good things about this particular go round is that the Democratic Party seems to understand that now, whereas mm-hmm. in the past they've always been in complete denial about that. But this time they know it and they're they're thinking about what to do about it. And I thought Biden, I thought that was kind of uh, uh, charming and, uh, you know, and, and interesting. And I, it kind of made me like him a little bit. But I agree with you. He's a complete disappointment on the issues. And ultimately, he's going to wander into a lot of the same traps that Hillary wanted wandered into mm-hmm. you know this complete complacency I, speaking of charts the other day i was looking at uh, a graphic from 2016 that was charting the two candidates at the time on a number of issues and the, although the, tr- the 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 text that accompanied this like you know really boring political science uh, kind of graphics the text didn't point this out but i noticed it that that uh, you know trump was too being the republican was to hillary's right on every issue, except for one. Trump was uh, was either perceived by the political scientist or by the public, I couldn't tell which, as being to Hillary's left, like well to her left, on trade right. issues. And there was also the uh, social insurance issues where it just wasn't clear. It looked like they were completely uh, occupying the same spot. Um, and uh, these, this is a source of danger to the Democrats, and they don't understand that, that when you let a guy like Trump be perceived as you know being to your left on one or two of these issues you're in trouble it caused all and by the way this is something the democrats are still completely in denial about is how trump managed to beat them right. and what what he did they haven't really come to terms with that how many um, excuses have you heard at this point i mean in 2016 <laughs> we heard a million but yes right and, and more since then as hillary has rolled them all out one after i feel very sorry for her though i don't want to go after hillary she's clearly a very she's embittered by what happened to her and and who wouldn't be i mean it's it's dreadful uh and i i in some ways i feel very you know, very sorry for her, but it's as though for years they they wanted to blame everything except for you know their own screw ups, you know their own mistakes. Well, uh, and, after and four it, years, you'd think that you know. I, I assume she's gone to therapy as we all have, <laughs> if we can get it. <laughs> you speak for yourself, Nomi. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was the one who's out there. It's like, you know, I, I wrote a whole book about this before it happened. Come on. <laughs> You could have write, written pre what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, a, it's you know, it's crazy. But uh, it, for a while, they were willing to blame uh, James Comey. Do you remember that? Yes, and remember then, but then they changed their minds about that. He became a kind of hero for them. And so they, they won't even blame him anymore, you know. So uh, there's, there's you know, still a lot of denial um and, and uh, you know, the, the people who managed the Hillary fiasco, uh, they all sort of got kicked upstairs, mm-hmm. you know, went on to Harvard or whatever it is. And, you know, they're 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 still in the game and they're they're doing great. Um, how does that work? I mean, you've, you've been very good at explaining <laughs> how this DC system works. That is Washington. You know, yeah. it's it, you know, if you were in if you were in with the right people, there is just no there appears to be no downside ever. It's yeah. it's it's. It's highly ironic, Nomi, that one of the great sort of uh, points of almost uh, religious faith for this faction of the Democratic Party is the idea of meritocracy. Mm-hmm. You know, they love they love this idea. They consider themselves to be products of the meritocracy. Meritocracy is what made America great, and they always mean by meritocracy they mean you know what you how you did in school, you know where you went to college, that kind of thing. They don't mean the sort of Ayn Rand. Um, meritocracy, where it's you know the, the the most forceful, you know strongest, richest guy, you know muscles his way to the top and mm-hmm. and stays there. They mean, you know, I got good grades in high school. I did well in the SAT. Therefore, I deserve everything that I've got. And what's funny is that the same people who believe in this so profoundly, there is no, <laughs> there is never any accountability for these people. You know, you can't have a meritocracy without accountability and these people just go from failure to failure to failure it's 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 extraordinary they're they're literally failing their way up and they punish people who uh, oh the rest of us live in brutal a brutal meritocracy by the way i have been you know i'm writing a book about populism now did i tell you this tell us about it yeah yeah and i've been working on it for a year and a half and i'm 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 very close to the last stages the book is going to come out in june and timing 
Uh, well, we shall we shall see. But it's I've been worried. I'm I'm dealing with the you know copy edits right now, and I'm on it twenty four seven as you might imagine. And uh, but one of the really weird things that I have come across is the way you know as the Democrats as a sort of centrist faction took over the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party moved away from uh, from organized labor and lost sort of lost touch with the concerns of working people and became a very different party. That's the subject of Listen Liberal, by the way. But as as that happened, Republicans learned how to. And I've written about this before as well. But Republicans learned how to mimic left-wing language, how to do this kind of, you know, this is what I used to call fake populism. This is what What's the Matter with Kansas was all about. Right. But it's gotten, it's gotten so much worse since What's the Matter with Kansas came out. And I was watching a, uh, you can watch this too, there's this debate between Steve Bannon and David Frum, um, you know, a conservative versus a conservative. It happened in, I think, Toronto, Canada, and they they filmed it, and it's you can watch it on on YouTube or whatever it is. I forget where you you have to go to watch it. But in the in the course of this debate, Steve Bannon, of all people, you know, this is the great villain of you know, of nice. Trump's rise. But Steve Bannon says something to the effect of, um, "In America, we have a." Uh, we have socialism for the rich and a brutal Darwinian struggle for everybody else. That's right. You know, so it's, uh, it, so it's meritocracy for you and me, but these people on top are just like there's never any accountability for them. Mm -hmm. And that's always been, as in my lifetime, has been something that my kind of bitter, cynical left-wing friends say to one another. You know, they read Noam Chomsky and say stuff like this. Well, now it's it's Republicans saying this. Yeah. It is just it is it boggles the mind how they have swiped one after another these kind of left-wing talking points and bent them to their own purposes. Uh, of course, the results are always the same. You, you know, Paul Ryan gets tax cuts, right? Mm -hmm. More tax cuts, more tax. Mm -hmm. Us, right, but the talking points are fascinating. They just they steal from us. So what's so anyway. interesting about that? I, I you know I understand that Donald Trump uh, had this this power over especially the New York media, and he he could get free airtime. But I I, it I wonder still if does, you know on and on and on. I, I wonder if they could have fa if they had somebody that you know wasn't a billionaire but somehow was was able to get free airtime and was an actual populist, would they have run with that person instead? Because the R's or the D's? The R's, the Republicans. Because, you know, it, you know, Donald Trump obviously didn't come from working class background. You know, he came no, from Queens. No, of course yeah. not. But yeah, it, it, his his uh, remember they used to call him the blue collar billionaire. Right. And there's a, one of these pop, fake populist books that I was that I was looking through is called Billionaire at the Barricades. I mean, there's all of this imagery of Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, there's all of this imagery of Donald Trump, you know, like driving a tractor, Donald Trump. Right. You know. Yes. I remember those with his red hat. It's, I, I can't okay. wait to but, see him up against Bernie Sanders. <laughs> well, that is what. Wow. Isn't that going to be a mind blowing yeah. you know, confrontation if that actually comes to pass? The the, the so I, my my suspicion is that Bernie will would whip his ass except for there's there's a couple complications and one of them is that um uh, the democratic party has become to a certain degree the party of of wall street and the mm -hmm. party of silicon valley i mean you look at uh at who funded obama and who funded especially who funded hillary clinton's uh run and uh uh you know silicon valley's up there a lot of you know uh, universities well those people don't like bernie sanders <laughs> They don't and like so, regulations for sure. Right. No, they're, 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 they might change sides. Yes. So I think Bernie would have, if all other things were equal, if they, if the candidates had were roughly matched in terms of fundraising and what they could spend on the campaign trail and that sort of thing, I think Bernie would, would, uh, would have an, you know, it would be, it would be a wipeout. He would, uh, he would wail on Donald Trump. Uh, but it, it, it could get, it could get tricky if you see something like that happening. Now, the answer, the historical answer to that is Franklin Roosevelt. So in 1936, this is another subject that I've been researching. In 1936, the powers that be in this country turned against Roosevelt in an overwhelming way. I, I don't, uh, you know, the fundraising, we don't know exactly what it was. Because he took the, them on, right? 
Right, he took them on, but the corporate world was against him in this in this sort of unprecedented way. I mean, uh, shoulder to shoulder with unanimity, they had the press on their side. Roosevelt thought the press was against him by eighty five percent. Every newspaper endorsed his opponent. You know, you go right down the list. It was this extraordinary display of unanimity by the establishment. And Roosevelt beat him and uh, beat the Republican in one of the, I think, still to this day, the all time biggest. Um, landslide in in u.s history you know he won every state except from maine and vermont (laughs) you know yeah it was just an overwhelming uh defeat and or or victory and and uh you know obviously that's the that's the model you can if you can build a movement if you have a movement behind you you can do things like that and it doesn't really matter how much money the other team has raised well today i don't know i don't know if that sort of thing is possible anyhow if bernie gets the nomination we're going to find out now me. It's going to be. It's going to be really. It's going to be absolutely fascinating because we. I don't think Wall Street votes would would uh, would would put its money where its its values are. You know, they have their very liberal values on on all sorts of uh, of culture culture war matters, all sorts of other questions. But ultimately, for them, what matters is you know who's going to regulate them, who's going to make them pay taxes, and that's, uh, and that's really just the top, though. I mean, you see libertarians, you see, I mean, Silicon Valley. I, I don't know if there's enough votes to to swap no, but the out money. I mean, the money, the money, have, right? You know. Exactly. They and, are, the, as one of my friends puts it, that's the new Wall Street. I mean, they're in some ways they're going to be bigger players than Wall Street was. And they're uh, powerful in other ways too. I mean, we we see who they're lining up with, who their investors are. You have foreign entities. Oh, powerful that, in other ways. Uh, wait a minute, you're talking to someone. Well, my industry is being swallowed right. by Facebook. You know, journalism. It's the most extraordinary thing. It's happening before our eyes, and nobody's lifting a finger to stop them. And no one's asking questions. I mean, yes, people are asking questions about who who their investors are, but we talk about foreign meddling in elections all day long, but we don't say, you know, why is it that Russian interests, Russian oligarchs are investing in in Facebook or, or Saudi Arabian? And what kind of play is that in America? But some of the tech companies, of course, that are based in other countries that don't that have looser regulations. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about that. And how does the tool affect an election? So if you have, uh, you know, some app that's based in China. Yes. Is that affecting the election? I know. Well, you're getting into a territory right. that I don't know a lot much, about. Much bigger conversation. And whenever anybody brings this kind of thing up, I, I, I get, get, I'll go immediately George Orwell on them. And I, I, I'm, my whole life, I've always expected the worst. But expecting the worst today is kind of it's it's too dark, even yeah. for me. You know. Yeah. So. On that note. <laughs> <laughs> They're watching us. I know. <laughs> Whoever I know. they it's, it's like My refrigerator is watching me. You know? It literally is. I, I, I've seen these. I'm like, why does your refrigerator need to have these tools? I mean, just buy a cheap refrigerator. No, no, I'm, seriously, I'm like going to start buying old appliances. Yeah. Like this monitor top refrigerator. I mean, they not only are, do they not spy on you, but they look really good. They're streamlined, you know? They should. You should get a. Um, that should be a, a, a business. Like people are buying old records. You know, buy. Oh, the old oh hey, I never threw mine away. I'm a total vinyl. I mean, I have I have two record players plugged in at this moment. Everything in this in this house is is you know, yeah, total retro. Uh, you know, retro technology here. <laughs> Live the retro life. Flip phones and <laughs> old refrigerators. That's an excellent idea. Sounds great. Uh, so the good old days. Um, I I do want to go back to the good old days at least. In some aspects. <laughs> well, hey, uh, an extremely liberal Democrat, like absolutely wailing on the on a conservative Republican by the biggest landslide of all time. I like that. That sounds great. I'd like to see that happen again. We'd like a more diverse party, though. You know, they didn't have that back yeah. then. But, uh, yeah, you know, right. we, we learn in some ways. Uh, Thomas Frank. You're amazing. I feel like we could talk for hours and I would love to have you back on to discuss the state of the race. Maybe your your book will be done by then, hopefully. Yes, so it'll be out in June. It's going to be it's going to be awesome. Um and I'll I'll be posting. I haven't been on social media in I think a year and a half. That's and uh, but I'll be I'll be letting the world know. And yeah, the book will be out in June and it's going to be well, I don't know. I hope it's going to be good. I don't want to jinx it. It's good timing and uh, I think that might be the trick for writing a book is not going on social media. <laughs> it's my my issue. <laughs> yeah. All right, Thomas, thank you very much. <laughs> you got it. We'll talk to you soon.
Thank you for joining our show today. And if you aren't already, please click subscribe and become a patron at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. See you next week. 